Good afternoon. I'm here again today as your Police and Crime Commissioner alongside my Chief Constable having a discussion and challenge session in public asking the questions that I have heard you wanting to hear answers to in her voice directly to help you understand the support you receive from policing and the approaches that the Chief Constable who is responsible for operational policing delivery is taking on your behalf to keep us all safer. Um, in any year when we're doing this um, and, and at each time there have been events that have uh, been on our minds um, whether that is as a result of terrorist or criminal activity or events of particular moment to the community and it won't surprise anyone um, that my first question will relate to one of those. So Chief Counsel, my first question today is about the impact of the Gospel um, War Memorial Hospital report, independent panel report that came out in the last few days and about the impact of that on public confidence. Um, it will be in very many people's minds um, uh, that the impact of Bishop James Jones's report and his team um, was a surprise for scale and breadth. And my question to you is, how are you planning to go about rebuilding public confidence in the constabulary? And particularly, what immediate reassurance to the public can you give? Thank you. Um, and it is absolutely appropriate that that's the first question. The first thing to say, of course, is that uh, thoughts are with uh, the families affected, upwards of 456, and the panel's report was clear that there may well be more than that, of course. And from the constabulary's perspective, we absolutely welcome the report. We are committed to transparency and have been supporting uh, the panel uh, and all of its uh, terms of reference over the last four years while it's been considering its work. And we've had dedicated people on that and we have submitted every single thing that we have uh, to the panel. And to give you a sense of scale, that's 25,000 documents, 100,000 pages. So everything the constabulary has in its records, the panel has. But we do welcome it um, and are su supportive of the report and, of course, have accepted all that it says. The first thing I did when I read the report, and the constabulary didn't have it in advance, so we, we, we had it um, after the families as is entirely right and proper, we read it very carefully um, and I wrote to uh, Bishop James shortly afterwards uh, thanking him, thanking his panel. Uh, and for me, uh, the significance of what that report has done does have huge implications, of course, for the constabulary, for policing, but much more so, I think, for health and social care more widely. And we're seeing that, aren't we, in the public debate that's happening every day. But to your question um, around trust and confidence, we have had a phrase all the way through as we prepared for this uh, report and supported the panel's terms of reference, which is families first and their trust and confidence in the constabulary. Whilst I have had no direct contact, nor should we have done because of the, the, the panel's role and locus in that, um, is that clearly uh, widely reported that we have lost uh, the trust and confidence of, of any, but certainly too many of those families, and I respect that. So uh, in terms of next steps, there are two things. There's acknowledging the past and at the right time um, I'm speaking with and will want to speak with uh, the bishop in terms of how the constabulary can, can best do that and meet the family's needs. But of course what the panel uh, report talks about is future uh, consideration and investigation in the wider sense of that word. So the police of course will have a part of that, so will the CPS, so will wider health agencies and others. And there's a number of agencies, as you know, Commissioner, that are in there. And I am very confident that today's constabulary uh, could do an excellent job, would do an excellent job in investigating whatever needs to happen next. I have confidence in my investigators today. I have confidence in the local policing offer we make each and every day. The question is whether we should do it. Um, and because uh, of those families and their uh, understandable concern around what has gone on before in terms of the quality of those investigations, I took the decision that to ask another police force to do that future investigation. The scale of it, the parameter of it, parameters of it, I don't know now, but equally are not for me uh, as Chief Constable of Hampshire to say, uh, but that is something that I'm getting a lot of support from my wider National Police Chiefs Council uh, colleagues and leads, and that uh, will play out as the days go by. 
So we stand ready to support that. We stand ready to uh, support that future investigation, whatever the, the extent of it may be, and indeed stand ready to support any recommendations that come arising from the panel uh, and future, uh, future work, future contact with families and beyond. Um, and we will do that in a way that is absolutely transparent. We take that very seriously. We've talked about that here in these Compass meetings before and it's the way uh, that Hampshire Constabulary uh, runs and we're very proud to do so. Can I push you a little bit more on the um, uh, this uh, latest report has taken four years to deliver yeah. and you and I arrived around two years ago um, and it would have been something that we were waiting to see what we would hear. Are you reassured that in those two years that the those lessons that should have been learnt and those um, actions that could have been taken in that time, at any point were they reviewed or were you reassured that what was known at the time had been pursued in the story so far up until this one which changed the breadth mm. and scale of it? So, to your point, the investigations concluded in 2006. That was the third police investigation. The first two, uh, I accept as the panel has said, were not, uh, were not good enough. Um, the one that concluded in 2006, the panel reflect, could have gone more widely. Uh, and again, we accept that. We did consider health and safety legislation. We did consider um, uh, corporate liabilities at that point as part of our investigation. Um, so we accept that. To your question about lessons learned, it, it's yes is the short answer, but also the context has changed in that the legislation is very different now. We now have a, a protocol which may, in light of this, uh, need review, of course, and I'm very open to that, but it's a national protocol about how the police should investigate deaths in healthcare settings. That's owned by uh, a, a combination of agencies from the National Police Chiefs Council, the CPS, um, health uh, regulators, health and safety executive, and so on. There are a number of signatories to that, and it may well be that that's looked at again. But, but since 2006, the context of how uh, police investigations in a healthcare setting are undertaken is fundamentally different anyway, as indeed, uh, and it has been well reported, the context within the health environment in that 10, 12 years has changed as well. So however disappointing, there are significant changes to yeah. as we are today Very and much. how we were at that point. Absolutely. And acknowledging that uh, the necessary reviews to take forward and land some of those issues that remain live today and scaled up by the bishop in his, and his team's mm. report should not be confused with being that's where we are today. No, indeed. And, and the Bishop's Report very accurately talks about a number of things pertinent purely to Hampshire Constabulary, mm -hmm. and we accept those. But it also uh, describes a number of issues around the overall policing, the overall health system, mm -hmm. and how it operates together. Um, and of course, those are wider than purely Hampshire. Okay. And can you just reassure us again in your voice and for the purposes of this in public presentation, whilst you have felt it appropriate to allow someone else to lead taking this forward, your commitment on behalf of yourself and your whole constabulary to support that and be proactive in supporting all the work that goes forward. Absolutely. We are forward leaning in that regard. I am very clear um, and I have therefore asked my uh, National Police Chiefs Council lead for major crime to, to, to take the lead in this and to assist uh, in finding another constabulary. But of course there will be a need for Hampshire to uh, both support that, supply what we have, but as I said, all that we have the panel has. So it is to be decided how that will be accessed, of course. But we will be, in whatever way we need to be supportive, but also independent. It's very important from the family's perspective that they know that, uh, that it's independent and we will be extremely keen to ensure that that not only is done but that they yes. can have confidence yeah. that it's done. It is done and is seen to be done. And seen and, to be and, done. And that's, and that's yeah. a key part of reassuring Absolutely. the public, I'm Absolutely. sure you would agree. Good. Uh, thank you for that um, answer to that important question. Um, and uh, I know everybody that I speak to of all the partners is concerned that this was appropriately a study that focused on the families and led to that. You have reinforced from your point of view leading the constabulary that your first response is to the families. Absolutely. But there is a, an underlying institutional requirement for us to engage with partners and to make that progress to 
add additional pressure that would stop these things occurring in the future um, to best effect. And I know we share a view of progressing that. Mm -hmm. I'm sure. um, of the other pressures, very recently, there's, uh, drugs is very much in all our minds. It's not only the season for festivals mm. um, and good weather and uh, all, all those sort of things, but um, the Mutiny Festival on the 26th of May yeah. highlighted the issues we can have with illegal use of drugs and the tragedy of two young deaths reinforced the need for this risk to be routinely tested with partners. Mm. Um, and that we are delivering on our promise to keep people safer, which we make together. I immediately asked for you to review your plans for any lessons to be learnt. And so my question today is, what lessons have you learnt from this incident to inform change or improvements in arrangements mm -hmm. for the rest of this season and strategically for the future? So um, there are a number of, of, of aspects to that. So the first one is, I mean, as you say, awful tragedy at the Mutiny Festival. Those two young lives and their friends and families, um, awful. Um, the primary responsibility for, uh, for festivals, and we have a number, as you say, Commissioner, in, in our area, lies with uh, the local authority, but also with um, a multi-agency safety advisory group, which comprises all agencies that one would expect uh, who have a, a role in festivals, and together uh, they uh, describe and they, they articulate the, the, the way that that festival should uh, proceed and links in of course to the licensing of any such festival as well and the constabulary informs that so we have a role in being a part of that advisory group but also informing it from the policing perspective but which is but one part um, you'll know that um, as a result of last year's um, uh, festival there were a number of issues raised by the constabulary about potential risks uh, and they were heard um, and uh, we don't yet know um, the, the, the formal debrief of that to your question about lessons learned, we are this week conducting an internal debrief, as we routinely do of any major event, and any festival is a major policing uh, operation. So that debrief, which is an internal one, is this week. It will then feed a multi-agency debrief uh, later on, which the uh, Portsmouth City Council are leading, and the constabulary will contribute to that. And that debrief will be uh, by all partners involved, and of course will then reflect into future licensing and, and more importantly lessons learned as well. In the more immediate term we have fed in to uh, the national policing lead for festivals so that they can understand as much as we know what happened at Mutiny and of course a lot of this is still under investigation and still being considered so I don't have all, all those answers and I'm sure you appreciate that uh, today but we have fed that back in so anything can be picked up by other police forces and other safety advisory groups around the country and indeed I'm confident from the multi-agency debriefing that that same thing will be done. Um, this last weekend we had the Isle of Wight festival um, as you say in brilliant sunshine um, 50,000 people were there, uh, had a very successful and wonderful time, I understand. Um, from the policing perspective, um, we did see an increase in drug seizures there um, as well, and it's been widely reported in the media, actually, um, that we uh, quadrupled the amount of drug seizures from there this year. But we did see a decrease in violence um, with a total of, of, of seven, seven too many, of course, but seven offences across those 50,000 people and uh, an increase in theft from tents, um, so just over 60 compared with the fifth from, uh, sorry, from 10 last year. So, so largely a very successful, very safe operation, which is what so much of policing is all about. We put a huge amount of effort in to, if you like, nothing happening in that people can enjoy uh, their festivals, their time in great numbers together. The specific issue of drug testing at, at festivals is a very pertinent one. Um, it is a matter for each and every festival and its licensing conditions and the organiser and the safety advisory group. So there's a number of people to uh, consider that particular issue. It is something that's available. Um, the national guidance around it very much is that it's a health issue as, a, as opposed to a police issue and the police are very confident and comfortable around that. And what it means in practice is um, if there is uh, drug testing, and, and what I mean by that is 
that someone who is going to take a drug for their own use can go somewhere and get it safely tested to make sure that they're about to take what they thought they were going to take and not a rogue substance. Um, and that's a, a tried and tested route that we have good uh, relationships with the Crown Prosecution Service over and good policing protocols so that people can do that safely, knowing that uh, they won't um, be uh, you know, grabbed by a police officer afterwards. But it is something for individual use. It is something that is very carefully not for people you know, testing bulk uh, drugs and so on. So we've always had that available to us um, and as I say it's down to each and every festival organiser and every licensing um, decision as to whether that's going to be appropriate because festivals vary enormously in uh, the people who attend um, and the nature of them. Um, I'm glad you covered um, testing facilities. I might have asked you about that if you hadn't covered those and, and thank you for that um, first bit of the answer. Uh, can I ask you to uh, go a bit further on talking about the keeping us safe priorities that policing will mm. have. Um, the talking about testing then, uh, and you emphasize individual use, um, where do you think the greatest impact to keep people safer in relation to uh, either not using illegal drugs or protecting people from illegal drugs? What are your priorities for that? More generally than festivals? Um, I, I think in festivals as well. Perhaps I, um, uh, I, I was trying not to give you an answer, but, but the, um, that sense of it's uh, trying to impact um, and intervene and prevent suppliers rather than um, uh, individuals who sure. find themselves doing it. Is, is, sure. uh, is, uh, are you and your teams making enough impact on intervening the supply? We could always do more. Um, so individual using drugs, making a choice around drugs, um, I would always prefer that they didn't because of the risks and we've seen those um, the, the two tragic deaths um, and, and each and every one is one too many. So I would always prefer they didn't but I also know that people will which is where that balance around um, people being able to be, be confident in what they are choosing to take. Um, our priority is drug-related harm. So that is where, uh, both at festivals but also more widely, uh, we put a huge amount of effort proactively to find out who is looking to deal the drugs, who is looking to uh, create uh, cuckooing opportunities, vulnerable people in their, their homes elsewhere, from whom then you know, their, their, their home is taken over so people can drug deal from it people who are being made to, to carry the drugs, often young people. So we are looking at the drug-related harm. Uh, and we also see, uh, have seen an uplift in, in violence um, associated with that as well. So our focus is on the harm that, that drugs cause and the, often the spin-off crime that comes as a result of that. Uh, we do a lot. Um, there is also always more that we could do. And one of the things that I'm concerned about and wanting to do more of is that proactivity to stem the supply and really make this a hostile environment for drug dealers to come to. Good. Um, uh, I, I'm on record as saying that one of the things that people can do to keep themselves safer is not take drugs. And I'm also on record as saying that the suppliers of drugs generally, if they're not known to you um, and they're people you meet at short notice, are not reliable because the drugs themselves are not reliable for their substance, however they're described. Are those two still the most important safety sentences to say and then for that to go alongside testing and other things that people can do? It is, is always it safer not to take it a, a, at all. And it is illegal currently? Of course. Um, so uh, do you have any views that you care to share on the uh, Chief Counsel of Durham's view about? I prefer not. Okay, done. That's all right, Michael. Um, question three. Uh, it's quite all right. You're Thank police, you. You're policing the law as it stands at the moment. Um, uh, I want to move on to violent crime and knife crime. Um, the, I think the statistics show that um, crime in many areas um, and particular crimes is reducing, but um, in the nation mm -hmm. and also in um, our constabulary, violent crime and knife crime are rising in some areas. Yeah. Um, uh, the public demand a response from policing to reassure them about the future levels of these most harmful of crimes and that today they want to know that you are successfully intervening where such crimes mm -hmm. occur. Um, not only in the light of the Home Office National Serious Violent Crime Strategy, 
but um, because it must be on your agenda anyway, what are you and your constabulary doing to tackle this issue in our communities to keep us safer? Um, so you're absolutely right. What we find here in Hampshire area is, is mirrored um, around the country, whereby, as you say, crime, um, generally crime on the streets is falling, but we have seen an increase in, in, in serious violence uh, and we have seen an increase in knife crime. And just to give you an example, um, so the year 1718, so finishing at the end of March in 18, we'd recorded across our constabulary 849 knife crime incidents compared with the previous year of 635. And of that 849, um, over a quarter were related to domestic incidents. And I think that's the first thing I want to say is that the vast majority of violent crime and serious violent crime happens in the home and happens but in relationships and that is something that is uh, across society it is across our area uh, and is a huge uh, societal blight so um, that's the first thing to say that that it isn't something um, that is that is necessarily uh, always in the public domain a lot of it is in the private domain and I am really pleased that year on year the constabulary has more reports coming to us so that we can work with partners to try and help people be safe um, and to deal with perpetrators and to stop it happening because the harm to both uh, the people living with that but also the children who are growing up with that is, is huge. Um, so most serious violence does happen in a domestic environment. To the point around the uh, National Serious Violence Strategy, I really welcome it. I think it's a very thoughtful piece of work. It describes um, the breadth of violent violent behaviour, it describes the roles that so many of us, me, you and, and others uh, beyond our roles can and should undertake. Um, so we are hugely committed and were before the Serious Violence Strategy was published to working with our partners on this front and I know Commissioner you've been uh, challenging me around that and, and, and I welcome that. In fact tomorrow you're hosting uh, a serious crime meeting with uh, community safety partners and others to talk about exactly this issue and I welcome that. So there are roles for health, there are roles for local authorities, for police and, and many others. We've had for some years here uh, an operation in policing called Operation Fortress, which is uh, the constabulary role in, to the point of your previous question, getting upstream around dealers, uh, trying to stop it happening, finding out who is abusing others and cuckooing others, uh, finding out those that are uh, abusing and children and getting the kids to to, to carry the drugs and so on. And I'll just share uh, in a, an anonymous way a card I got only this week from a, a lady, I won't give her name, who's been the victim of cuckooing for years. And cuckooing is where a drug dealer will take over your home um, and then enforce the fact that, they, that you're, they're going to deal drugs from it. Um, the neighbourhood team uh, in Basingstoke had identified her. She'd had a number of instances of cuckooing by various drug dealers over the years. The neighbourhood policing team, together with housing, local partners, together put a range of, of measures in place so that the neighbours were looking out for suspicious behaviour, looking to help protect her and get upstream of things. And she wrote a lovely thank you card saying for the first time, as a result of that multi-agency effort, she feels she's got her life back. Uh, and it was one of the most extraordinary letters I've had, actually, for someone in that, in, you know, who's been living with that to, to feel able to, to, to write and for things to be so very different. So I've talked about Operation Fortress. We have another operation, which is Operation Scepter. That's a national one, uh, and that's about tackling knife crime. Uh, and we, that's, we have knife amnesties um, uh, fairly regularly, but we also uh, look at trying to identify through good intelligence. And people do tell us, and I'm very grateful to any of the public who tell us, because we always act on this, to find out people who are habitually carrying knives and to prevent that happening. And what we see, and again, this is a national issue, is that too many young people are carrying knives because they, in order to keep themselves safe, which of course, sadly, um, doesn't necessarily follow. So we're trying to break that um, habitual knife carrying uh, and respond always to intelligence that comes our way uh, to that effect. And then the other piece around uh, the violent crime strategy is the county line drug dealing and that point of cuckooing, that point of using young people to carry the drugs. And the National Crime Agency have said this is a very significant threat across the UK uh, and it is in our constabulary area as everywhere else. And the National Crime Agency in, in June of this year 
have assessed about 1,500 county lines that they believe to be currently active, uh, with about 250 operations live across the UK. More locally, we, um, over the same period, we've had over 100. So we are very much connected with the National Crime Agency and the way of tackling uh, county lines crime is everything from the very local to the global. So it's everything from local partnerships, local healthcare professionals, local PCSOs, local special constables, local intelligence from people who see things in their own community, all the way through to the National Crime Agency. And that uh, is a very swift flow of information and we are all lined up to tackle it together. Um, thank you for that. Um, you, you take a national role as well as um, leading locally um, for children and young people. Yes. Um, and uh, I've heard you say many times and uh, alongside lots of colleagues and partnership is a theme of much of what we talk about um, that early intervention matters so much. Um, can you talk a little about how that lands from a policing pers perspective locally here? What um, you can bring to that to prioritise and engage with early intervention? Absolutely. So early intervention uh, is is effectively prevention mm. and getting up as upstream as you possibly can. It's not mm. early in terms of years, mm. albeit there is a significant amount one can do with young children, but it is early in terms of offending behaviour or propensity mm. to uh, offending behaviour. And there is myriad uh, research which describes how that is so effective in actually mm. stopping harm, stopping offending, and often mm. breaking what can be generational, intergenerational um, offending. So there's a number of things. So, so locally we have Project Gateway, which uh, you commission, which is looking at the young adult cohort to, uh, to stop them getting into a spiral of, of crime. Um, we look at uh, early intervention around in our custody blocks. There's a liaison and diversion service, which is in all of our custody blocks in Hampshire and is being rolled out across the country, which is about making sure that there are professionals in a custody environment. So if someone is arrested and comes into our custody, right at the start we're looking at mental health needs, alcohol needs, uh, drugs needs, so that we can meet those because often they can be the driver for uh, the offending behaviour. We look very much at um, people who are missing, um, how frequently they're missing and what's behind their missing behaviour. Are they being subject to uh, sexual exploitation? Are they being subject to to, to, to drug dealing, etc., as we've talked about. Um, and there's also um, something very much to look around what's described as adverse childhood experiences, which policing nationally is, is, is uh, doing a huge amount of work in, alongside health partners and others, which describes the set of cards, if you like, that a young person is dealt. And if someone grows up with, um, they live in an environment of domestic abuse and mental health and alcoholism, and they're hungry, and, and, and. There are, if one has four or more adverse childhood experiences, the likelihood of you then becoming a victim of crime as well as a perpetrator is heightened. It's not, it's not inevitable, but it's heightened. And of course, the flip side of that is, well, what helps someone not go down that path? And that's about how confident someone feels, how engaged they feel in part of their community, whether they have an adult looking out for them. They seem really simple things, but lots of young people don't have them. So making sure that we can, as the police, play our part in helping to ensure that young people grow up with that resilience um, where they need it will help stop them being victims of crime as much as stopping some but sadly, uh, too often too many, um, turning down that same path. You, um, no surprise to me, and I'm sure to um, many people who will hear your voice, um, you have a powerful advocacy in that area. I think the question that often comes out of that is, um, that's about partnering and lots of other people are in the same space and you said that you want to play your part in that, um, which is welcome. But the question is often, what is it that police and only police can do um, uh, from the things that we probably shouldn't be doing, which is the, um, uh, in the old days, the cuff round the ear is sometimes described by many people on the street saying we should return to that. Um, but the, practically today, what are the specifically policing interventions that make the difference to re yep. remove those vulnerabilities? So we, we don't cuff young people around the ear, nor will no, we, correct. Commissioner. Um, so what I say to um, the people I lead here in Hampshire Constabulary and with my national responsibilities more widely 
is policing has to be the profession that looks behind the behaviour. There is something that has driven a young person into the arms of the police. So if someone is shoplifting, yes, of course, we should deal, deal with that. And someone has suffered, someone has suffered perhaps financial loss or, or, or more. But in addition to dealing with it, we need to look behind the behaviour. We need to understand why. And I think that is a unique perspective that policing can have because, of course, that young person has come to our notice. Something has happened. Um, so that, I think, is unique to us. And therefore, we need to make sure that we have the right uh, partnerships locally, not just in Hampshire, but in, in all of our localities, the right ways to signpost people to those services. It means them being well commissioned uh, by you and your uh, peer group as well, Commissioner, um, and also that, um, that we are making sure that we join the dots. And so often it is about understanding what each of us knows. So a really good example of that is a, a, an operation which is around much of the country now, where if the police go to a domestic abuse incident in the evening, we tell the school of the young person who was living in that home by the next morning, because that means that the people who care for that child in the school environment, if they see different behaviours, if they see anxiety or whatever else, they have, can join the dots, they understand that wider context. And we are working very closely to bring it to the local uh, with all of our partners here uh, across the Hampshire Constabulary area around together doing harm reduction. Too often we're all worrying about the same people in the same environment and that sharing of information, which we do a huge amount of already, whether we can do even more to help us get as upstream as we possibly can. And I think something in that, um, I hear reports from the community about the impact and from education about the impact of that particular initiative to make sure people can listen better yeah. to the vulnerabilities of young people when they go back. Yeah. But the particular sensitivity is a key thing in doing that so that it doesn't be become counterproductive oh, in sure. terms of their yeah. doing it. Yeah. There's, always, there's always great nuance in that. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, we've spoken about drugs, we've spoken about violence and knife crime, um, and you've already introduced the impact of domestic abuse being mm. related to some of those. Um, uh, domestic abuse is also one of those areas of concern, and I think if um, you join those up together, is it right to think that the vulnerabilities do link together, and are there places to intervene that make the greatest impact? Mm -hmm. um, yes, domestic abuse is a hugely complex area um, and we know there are all sorts of reasons, um, coercion, control, power, finance, there's all sorts of ways that it can manifest itself. It happens across society, it, it, it happens across relationship, it happens across generation um, and it is hugely damaging to each and every person who's, who's involved in it. It is a significant priority for us. Uh, the language I use is that the police are here to look for people who need our help and then be great at dealing with it. And I am really pleased that year on year, the numbers of domestic abuse reports we get goes up. And, and that is a good thing because it means that we're then able to help and, and, and support uh, that environment however best we can and sometimes that is a criminal justice outcome but sometimes it isn't uh, and there are a number of options uh, available to us so it is a huge priority for us as I know it is for you um, and we've been doing a vast amount I have a dedicated um, chief superintendent who's, who's who leads on domestic abuse for me across the constabulary um, our staff are trained and and everyone has a good awareness and we are now training everyone frontline to, to even polish that even further so they have a, a really nuanced um, understanding of particularly coercion and control and how, um, how, how that can manifest itself sometimes over a very long period of time. So staff are having what's called DA Matters, so Domestic Abuse Matters training which is being delivered by Safe Lives who are a charity. Um, We've also looking at perpetrator uh, management. So again, commissioned service through you, um, which is really welcome about trying to stop what it is that, in, that makes a perpetrator behave in the way that they do. Uh, and there's lots of in innovative uh, perpetrator schemes here in, a, in an endeavor to, to break that cycle of behavior. We're also making much greater use of, of civil powers. So domestic violence prevention notices and domestic violence prevention orders. And they are to build in a period of space. Uh, so it's not a criminal uh, 
activity at all, but it can be put in quickly, effectively creating space and a safe space and time for um, someone who's been suffering this. So they can make careful and thoughtful choices that are right for them and their family. Um, and so we, we're doing many more of those. I've touched on adverse childhood experiences um, and domestic abuse, living with domestic abuse is an area of that and again that will uh, for us feature as part of our serious violence work that we've spoken about uh, already. And we of course work with numerous partners, Aurora New Dawn um, and others who are side by side with us in terms of both perpetrator programmes, supporting survivors and really giving us critical advice and be a critical friend to us to make sure we get this right. It would be remiss of me not to mention domestic abuse and the World Cup, sadly. Um, we find we are in the middle of the World Cup, which of course is great, but research uh, has told us uh, for years immemorial that when uh, we have major sporting events, particularly footballing ones, uh, we know that violent domestic abuse increases. Um, it goes up by 38%. Um, when England lose and 26% when they win. So um, it is desperately sad, I think, that something that is such a celebration of sport has such a dark side to it. So we know that and therefore we have planned very carefully to ensure that we've got extra resources, dedicated resources available uh, during this World Cup season alongside our partners to make sure that we are able to uh, raise awareness of that, to respond as quickly as we would want, and we always do, to, to when we get calls, safety planning with current, uh, so we know about current victims, to help them think about the consequences of the World Cup season um, and keep a really close eye on, on as you know, themes emerge or individuals emerge and make sure we, we uh, yeah. respond quickly. Not to disrupt your flow, but is it just the World Cup or is it similarly at other times? So is the World Cup um, an additional um, trigger for an these behaviours. It's an and additional trigger. Are we coping, are you and your team coping with the routine um, sporting distresses and violence that comes out of the results? Or is it the same in more local? So in terms of, I was talking about the domestic abuse context. Yes, yes. So, so yes we are because we've planned for it. Yes. Um, and, and that's, you know, our job is to yeah. be there for people who need, who need us and we anticipate mm -hmm. an uplift in demand and, um, and that's why we've, we've got that additional resource dedicated. I haven't yet got the stats, England have only played twice, no, no, to, no, to, know, no. to know the impact of this year. But it, it is an issue for local derbies and um, external matches not and so sportings. Not, uh, so not so much. Not so much. Not so that, much. That's, that's a useful thing to say. Um, you made the point that you are looking for things and being mm. proactive for things. Um, I'm often asked about um, the need for more visible policing, mm. and I'm sure you hear that message too. Is this one part of, and can you just talk about if, we're, if you and your team are being proactive and out of, about, is that something the public should understand more for where they can expect you to be rather than in police stations or rather than in other places that they may traditionally have thought you are? Is this, is this part of um, that story that the public need to hear? Yes, it is. So. Um I don't want my officers and staff in police stations, I want them out of them, um, which is why technology uh, and the investment that you've made is, is essential to that. Um, so yes, visible, accessible policing is the key for me. Um, it is different now, and I'll give you an example. So um, because our policing mission and offer have changed in the way that society has changed. So we keep children safe now online much more than we need to than you know, in our parks and open spaces, for instance, because that is where the risk is posed for them. There are brilliant things about the internet, there are also things that um, create risk from the internet. So we keep young people safe online. That isn't something that is visible with a uniform or a marked police car outside, but is a huge priority for us um, and wider law enforcement. We also, as you know, uh, worry a lot about cyber crime more generally. So there are far too many people who are being defrauded of life savings, be those individuals or uh, businesses. Um, and so we want to work hard with them to prevent that happening in the first place. And of course then to, to try and catch the perpetrators and stop them doing it to anybody else. Again, that happens behind closed doors. So there is a, a nature of, um, of, of, of crime which has shifted and a number of crimes have moved from the very public space in yesteryear to the private space. From, uh, however, what is very important um, 
and is very important to me, and I know it is to you, 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 you challenge me hard and appropriately on it, is that accessibility and that enduring relationship that policing has with local community, it matters. And that manifests itself here through our neighbourhood policing teams of officers, uh, special constables, volunteers, police community support officers, that whole team that has that enduring relationship with community is the bedrock of the British policing model and it's very precious, it's very precious and, and it's something that we uh, hold dear. And it matters not only because of um, how confident that makes people feel and how much they like to see it and to know their local officer or, or PCSO or special constable, but we also know that it defeats the real harm. We know that neighbourhood policing defeats terrorism. We know that it has an impact on serious organised criminality. These things are not separate. Um, and therefore that enduring relationship, having the quiet word, seeing things that look different and look unusual uh, and knowing to tell someone about it, that matters enormously to us. Okay, thank you. Um, I gave you some slight forewarning of the next question, um, uh, which is about um, uh, what only policing can do. Um, there you are, my Chief Constable sat mm -hmm. next to me wearing your uniform proudly and uh, commanding and uh, deploying um, the yep. constabulary. Um, a lot of what we've spoken about today is appropriately being partners with other agencies yep. to add value in a time of financial pressure. That's um, ever more important that we don't duplicate, that we reinforce and we work together. Um, but there are some things that policing only can do, that police officers only mm. can do, and uh, the supporting cast of people around them. Um, and uh, you've said out loud sometimes, um, which may be misunderstood for its purpose, that 80% of what you and your colleagues do is not directly related to crime. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd, I'd, I'd like you to talk a little bit about what that um, might mean. Um, to reassuring the public, but also if 80% um, or however you're going to describe it, um, if we dialed that down a bit and took some of that and applied it directly to crime, what would be the impact um, that only policing could do in relation to its work with crime of putting more of your resource to that area, which might be um, a key part of what only policing can do in preference to other priorities mm -hmm. that you understandably have, but maybe crime itself is something that should be dialed up. Well, crime is the absence of crime. Is the, the absence of crime is the success of policing. Robert Peel said it nearly 200 years ago, and it stands true today. So whilst we are great at investigating, we are great at victim care, I would much prefer it hadn't happened in the first place. So, so the absence of crime is the success as far as I'm concerned. I've talked about the changing nature of crime. Um, but to give you a sense of scale, so we get in the constabulary about a million calls a year. Um, about a quarter of a million of those are, are, are emergency calls. So it's about a million calls a year, and we have reported to us about 160,000 crimes. So that gives you a sense of, 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 of everything else. And contained within those calls are some really significant things. There will be people ringing in saying they're concerned about something. So they may be concerned about drug dealing or their neighbour or they're hearing domestic abuse next door. So, so they're, they're ringing in a... In a, in a exactly as we would want them to. Um, but they can also be ringing because someone's gone missing. We have huge numbers of, of people go missing uh, in our community. And of course, our role in that is to find them as quickly as we can to stop them coming to harm, um, either uh, because they're cold on a winter's night uh, and they can come to real harm physically, but also someone else may prey on them or indeed they may want to harm themselves. So, so, so much of what we do is, is prevention right at the start. We talked about festivals and the amount of planning that goes into that. Uh, only last month, the Royal Wedding, a huge policing operation, the manifestation of which is a fantastic event, a global event, which everyone enjoys and everyone keeps safe. But the amount of effort that goes into that and the cost that goes into nothing happening is, is a big part of, of the policing mission and one we take very seriously. And of course, that's not then um, in the public domain because nothing's happened. So. To answer your question about what the police only can do, if from a domestic abuse context, you know, only we uh, answer emergencies. Um, we go every day to about 600 
things, incidents, we turn up to about 600 things a day, of which 100 are domestic abuse. So that is a huge number of, of, of homes we walk into, lives we touch, um, some of which are emergencies, not all. Um, so we respond to emergencies in a way that other people can't. We can put people into formal criminal justice routes in a way that other people can't. So that, that judgment, that um, set of gateways that the police do is unique to us. The skill is how we then signpost and spin out and work with everybody else. Um, so there are things that are unique to policing. The question of how much uh, is, uh, in, is on crime, um, I w use the language of, of harm, so we are here to reduce harm, some of which is crime, some of which may not be. Um, another example would be, sadly, deaths on our roads. Uh, there may not be a crime involved in that, but it's a huge, and so it should be, a huge undertaking by policing with other uh, blue light services, but for policing to investigate that on behalf of the coroner, often. Um, so it's that kind of breadth of the policing mission, which uh, we do need, and I'm grateful for the question, we do need to, to try and explain and be more effective at, at explaining. Um, because we spin a lot of plates, and so we should. Yeah. And we're also monopoly suppliers, and I'm acutely aware of that as well. Okay. Um, and the, the, the small part of the question, um, I was mostly encouraging you to give that to, to explain to the public what the um, impact of the work is, and, and helpful to hear it in your voice. Um, if we were to retune, if, you were, if the public were asking you to retune to certain crime types, which, um, the, would you hear that and are the things that, um, I don't know, 5% of scale for the things that create harm that are crimes that are what mm. only policing can do, um, would that, uh, how would you hear that? Where would you get that information from? And are there any of those items in your mind at the moment? Sure. So um, we listen really carefully for that. Um, much of which comes through for your role and, and your locus within uh, community and listening for that as well. So we do uh, lots of surveys, there are the Hampshire Alerts, there's the, the, the work that your office does as well, but equally that enduring local policing team, they listen very carefully um, to priorities from communities, from community safety partnerships and others. And then we balance that with, with um, what we know are the risks potentially coming down the line that, that communities haven't yet felt. And it's that perpetual balance between what communities are interested in and what's in their interest. And I don't say that in any patronising way, but I do often have information that, that isn't necessarily seen or felt um, in, in a neighbourhood. And it's for us to articulate that and it's for us to explain that back. But that's how we prioritise. So, of course, if we had uh, more resources, Commissioner, and I know it's something that you and I share a concern over uh, within for Hampshire, then we would do more and different with it. So there is a bar ab above which I would like to be able to do more. So some of that would be about proactivity. I'd like to do more of that. That enduring relationship with local community, we can always do more of that. So we are forward leaning with the resources we have uh, and the money we have. And, and I know you challenge me to spend every single public pound as wisely as we can, and that is right. But if we had more, we could do more. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, the, you may be pleased to know that's the last question for this session. Okay. Um, uh, and I want to thank you and um, on behalf of the public. Um, I think it's really important that I challenge and ask you to explain to the public some key things in your voice. I hope that anyone who watches this um, will find it reassuring to hear the Chief Constable's voice and uh, informing and educating for what her priorities operationally might be and how she approaches them. Um, and I want to set this time uh, specifically some expectations for our next session in September um, uh, of things that um, uh, are um, in hand for review. Um, so the, I, I think there is a public tension. Lots of the questions are about some of those things that don't reach the highest threats and risks of harm, but create tension in communities. Antisocial behaviour is amongst them. And um, I, I will probably want to pursue with you how you manage um, resources and priorities and engage in those elements which might be included under early intervention. 
Um, uh, I also want to talk a bit about public confidence in organisations, not least because um, the institutional issues across lots of partners in public service, but um, from the Gosport War Memorial Hospital panel study, including some uh, questions about policing to talk about public confidence and activity in that area to ensure we can sustain the best of what policing motivation is to protect people. And just to talk out loud about that for a little while. And uh, I commissioned you a while ago to engage in a review of what local policing should look like and what local safety should look like. And I know you're, um, you have set a team in hand to do that. Um, uh, I think it might be a good thing to do um, by the time we get to the next session to just um, talk about where that might go and perhaps ask the public, give them some presentation of things that they might contribute to that if you're at that stage. So those are um, three things I'd like us to focus on. And um, again, if you're watching this, um, please do feel free to uh, write in and we'll give you the ability to contribute thoughts for the next Compass sessions. So it just remains for me to say um, I always um, I think the word is enjoy, but um, I welcome these conversations that we have. I believe they add value to getting your voice to the public and giving some sense of you know, your voice answering the questions that they ask me to challenge you about. So thank you very much for the answers you've given us today. Thank you.